Kings, if you would, with me. Last time, God gave Elijah a message. In the first six verses we studied, Elijah had gone to, the king, gone to King Ahab with a message. I want you to pay attention on your paper to the word message. God told him, I want you to go to King Ahab and I want you to give him a message from heaven. For earth. Elijah was faithful to deliver the message as instructed. It involved King Ahab shutting down demonic idolatry of Baal worship in the North Kingdom, or God would shut down the economics of the North Kingdom. Shutting down the economics of the North Kingdom would apply to the second cycle of divine discipline recorded in Leviticus 26, 18 through 20. This would be terrible for an agricultural economy. Leviticus, the 26th chapter, verse 19, 7, says that the second cycle of discipline would bring a drought. It said that God would cause the sky to be iron and the earth to be bronze. Think about that. And he shut it down immediately. It was not a long, drawn-out deal. When Ahab says, no way, Jose, God brought it on. As soon as Ahab says, I'm not buying the message of God, I don't care, boom, we were under it. Following the message to King Ahab, God instructed Elijah to hide at the brook Kedron until told otherwise. God further instructed Elijah that he, God, would provide logistical grace for him by ravens. Every morning meal and every night meal, and we talked about that last week. During, sometime during the third year of a three and a half year drought, recorded in 18th chapter, verse 1. The brook dried up, 17 chapter, verse 7. And God gave Elijah new instructions. Just about the time he got settled in to the logistical grace at the brook, God dried the brook up. Isn't that interesting? Three, sometime during the third year, and we only got another half a year, God wants them to go someplace else. Before this three and a half years over, I want you to go, I've got another message to deliver. And so he shakes his world up again. He'd gotten a pretty good uh, system going there with the brook and the ravens. They'd become kind of like friends, I suppose. Pretty comfortable. God shakes his world up again and says, no, I got new instructions and we're leaving this place. This brings me to my subject today. Where, is he go Where are we going? Listen, here's what's for sure. When God shakes up your old, little old world that you got all neatly, neat, you know, you've got, you, you finally, after three years, got a good place to sleep. You got a cover over you. The brook's doing good with you. The ravens are just wonderful. Life is pretty good in the midst of a drought. About the time you get comfortable in your little cave, he shakes up your world. Because, listen, your world is about his world. It's never about yours. Every time I get comfortable in my little old world, he shakes up my little old world to tell you your little old world is not yours, it's mine. Your little old world must be my world. Has he done that to you? Get ready. Get ready. He sure does it to mine, I can tell you. 
And you know how, you know what he gives you to tell you? Listen, look at, watch this, look at verse 8. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 2. You know how this all started with him? He shook up his little world, and he said, I want you to go to Ahab. Verse 2. The word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, now he's got him at the brook, and he shakes up his own little world again. The word of the Lord came to him. New instructions. You know how important this Bible study is? I mean, how does the Word of God come to your life? Lord, Lord, a great teacher for you? The Lord, is the Lord a good teacher for you? Better be. He'd better be. So the Word of the Lord comes a second time for him. The Word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to... A long distance. Zarephath. Zarephath is probably 100 miles. He's on the east side of the Jordan River in Gilead, which, by the way, was his home, his home area. That's like going back to the state of Alabama. His new instructions is to go all the way to the Mediterranean Sea to a seaport town, Zarephath, which lies between Sidon and Tyre. About probably 100 miles as the raven flies. I don't know how long it would be otherwise. And he's going to leave Gilead and Samaria, where the king was, to go to the Phoenicians. Going to the Phoenicia. Phoenicia on the Mediterranean Sea, which is a Gentile pagan area. I mean really pagan. If you think, listen to me, if you think it's bad in the North Kingdom under Baal worship, that's where he's being sent is, is, the, is where it all began. It's the Mecca center of Baal worship. It's the Mecca center. Next week I'm going to talk to you about two important women from that region in the life of Elijah. There are two women from that region that Elijah has to deal with. Not one, two. So he's told over here to leave a place that he was familiar with, Gilead, Samaria, the North Kingdom, familiar with the North Kingdom, he's told to leave Alabama and the United States and go to another country. What would we call him? We call him a foreign missionary. Won't this be interesting? Why is God sending him to a Gentile nation To a widow, a very famous widow in the Bible. We don't ever know her name. We never knew her name. Even when Jesus talks about her, doesn't give her her name. This is a widow of Zarephath, and that's all we know. But what an enormous story, which we're going to talk about a little bit today. Listen, here's what you need to know. If you come to Bible study and you hear the truth of the Word of God, listen to me now, it should, it should be a life-changing experience. 
And it depends on whether you positive, have positive volition or negative volition, whether it is. The Word of God, when it comes to you, it's a life-changing experience, but it depends on whether you're positive to the Word of God or negative. Are you receptive to the message or are you negative? It's a very important issue. You see, Elijah, it's a good sign because Elijah's positive. He says, look, we're, gonna, we're changing. Uh, pull up stakes, we're moving. You know what he does? He salutes. Watch this, verse 9. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. It means stay there until I tell you otherwise. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. Isn't that interesting? When he sent him to the brook, he said, go there and stay there until I tell you otherwise. I'm sending ravens. I've commanded ravens to provide for you. Remember that? Now, what's the point? Listen to me. Don't miss this. God is always out front of you. You can trust the word of God because God wouldn't give it to you, wouldn't reveal it to you if he hadn't already planned ahead for it. For example, do you think God's got a widow? Do you think God has got a widow when he gets there that he's got a widow looking for him to come? Do you think that? How come you can't do that with your life? How come you can't do that? Why do you have to see it to believe it? How come you can't walk by faith? You say you, you, say you walk by faith, but listen, the truth of the matter is you walk most of your life by sight. If I don't see it, I don't believe it. If I don't feel it and touch it, I don't believe it. See, we talk it, we don't walk it. I'm just, I'm just saying. He's got to believe that there's going to be a widow waiting on him when he goes, travels 100 miles to a foreign nation, that there's going to be a place for him. There's a, he's looking for a widow. Is he looking for a widow? I've commanded a widow. You suppose he was looking for the ravens to bring him food? Listen, if you walk by faith, you are. As soon as God says, it's done. See, we wouldn't believe God until, he, until a raven showed up. And then we'd probably struggle if he missed one meal. If he got sidetracked or was a little late getting there. What's wrong with us? Why can't we walk by faith? Faith is in the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Oh, I know I'm talking to, right now I'm talking to somebody on the internet. Please listen to me. I know I'm talking to you. Listen, the word of God, when it comes to you, should be a life-changing experience. I tell you, the word of God is that in mind. It's a life-changing experience. I love the word of God. I love the fact that he don't tell me, he, he, he doesn't tell me what's all going to be, he just tells me where I want you. He don't, he don't tell me, oh boy, it's going to be hunky-dory and this is going to be, nah, nah, nah. he just says, I want you to go. And listen, what, listen, the wonderful words, two commands, God commands him, arise and go. You know what, you know what he did? He arose and went. Never been there before. Looking for a widow that's looking for him. Look for a widow. I've commanded her to take care of you. What an interesting story that will be. It is important to note that God is always out in front of the spiritually advancing believer preparing a, where, preparing a ministry for the word of God that's sending him. The word of God that's sending him. God is already out front. He's already got the widow waiting. He's already got the raven ready to bring food to you. Logistical grace is no sweat off your brow. It's all off God's. But he's got to have somebody to go. He's got to have somebody that can arise and go. When God says, I want you to go speak to that person. You see that person crying over there? Go over there and speak to them. You see that person is talking about the going through a divorce and how miserable she is? You have answers for her life. 
Why don't you set up a time to have coffee and talk with her? Or oh, it would inconvenience you, wouldn't it? It would take you out of your comfort zone, wouldn't it? What do you think the Word of God has come to you to tell you to do? I'm going to shake up your comfort zone. If you've learned nothing from the life of Elijah, if you've learned nothing from the life of Joseph, if you've learned nothing from the life of Jesus, what is our problem? Then the word of the Lord came to him and said, Arise and go. I will provide for you. And so he did. Did you note once again Elijah's responsibility to trust and wait on the Lord? He went to the brook and he said, you stay there until I tell you otherwise. Now he tells him otherwise. Sometime during the third year, he tells him otherwise. Why don't you go to a foreign nation? Why, why? Listen, you sit around and talk all day. I don't understand why you want me to do this. I, you're upset my apple cart. Uh, my life is going to be turned I, I just got it comfortable. I just finally got it where I could... I got, just kind of got a home here. Now you want me to go. Yeah? That's right. I want you to go. I want you to, I'm shaking up your comfort zone. I want you to understand, trust and wait on the Lord. Trust and wait on the Lord. Or how about this? Trust and obey and wait on the Lord. There's a good hymn. Trust and obey. For what? Wait on the Lord. He didn't tell him ahead of time. He said, I want you to travel 100 miles or more, and I want you to look for a widow. He didn't tell him why. See, we think we're walking by faith, and half the time we're walking by sight because we want all the answers before we go. Wait on the Lord, Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. You know what that is? Listen to me. Faith cycle. Hearing, believing, applying, completing. Faith cycle. You know what that? Draw a line through it. You know what, you are, you know what side you're on? Applying, completing. That's the faith rest technique. That's where the faith tech reads. That's the side where faith rest technique works. Don't work on the other side. There he's trying to get you the promise to go. Here's where that works. And I hope you know that. The peop people often ascribe patience and waiting. Ascribe patience and waiting. They'll say things like, patience is a virtue. I don't disagree with that for the spiritual advancing believer. Faith is a virtue. You ever heard that? Patience is a virtue. Can I break it down easier for you? It'll never be a virtue unless you understand this principle. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. You'll never get to a place where patience is a virtue until you understand patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You know Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Number four, patience, fruit of the Spirit. If you, wanna, if you want the virtue of patience, you've got to learn the exercise of it. It doesn't come through the flesh. You've got to learn how to beat it on the flesh side to win it on the soul side. But... More important to understand patience as a fruit. Number two. It is also important to note the importance of the role of the directive will of God in making major decisions in the Christian life. He's got to make a, a major decision to leave his hometown, comfort zone, and go to a foreign country. 
Hasn't God patient? He's, he's prepared him for three years for this exercise to prepare him for a bigger ministry. These are all ministries. All ministries. And when he gets through with a widow up there, he's got Elijah prepared to come back and face the king. God always preparing you for some major event ahead of you in the plan of God. That's being spiritually alive. But listen, you've got to understand the directive will of God. When the word of the Lord came to him and said, I want you to go to King Ahab, he saluted and went to King Ahab and told it. When he left there, he said the word of the Lord came to him and sent him to the brook. Now the word of God has come to send him to a foreign nation. Phoenicia. The direct, directive will of God is a key to your life. It's the things that God revealed to you categorically. He's going to pop a categorical doctrine. He's going to tell you exactly how to live your marriage. Not to be happy. Listen, can I tell you two things? Get your pencil. If you have to write on your, on your skin, write on it. Write this down. Happiness is attached to happenings. They're related. Don't go for that. Don't go for that. Listen, go for this rather. Joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus. Go for the joy in Jesus. Don't go for happiness in happenings. Because they're always in turmoil. Happy today, sad tomorrow. Why? I lost my bicycle. Oh. Well, it's a good thing God gave you legs. Oh, yes. Think about those who don't have legs. If you base your happiness on happenings, you'll be miserable all your life. John 16, 33. But joy in Jesus. Joy in Jesus. Read the book of Philippians. Joy in Jesus is the name of the game. Don't have anything to do with what's happening. Doesn't, doesn't matter what's happening. Happening. John 16, 33. Joy in Jesus. You can learn it easily by the what? Fruit of the Spirit. Number two. You can learn it easily. Walk in the Spirit and, exp and, ex and have the joy of Jesus through the ministry of the Holy The joy of Jesus. The patience of Jesus. The peace of Jesus. The love of Jesus. Given by you, to you, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit inside your life. The directive will of God assigned to Elijah a new assignment. Arise and go to Zarephath of Sidon. That's the geographical will for a new ministry training ground. Stay with the widow until I tell you differently. That's the mental will of God, a waiting training. Pay attention to the 17th chapter, verse 8, and the word, behold. See, we miss the beholds in our life. The Word of God comes to us and He gives a big behold. This, I want you to pay attention because I want you to take that doctrine I just gave you and I want you to apply it to your life right there. See, that's the word behold. Behold. Listen, if there's a book you should ever write about your life, it should be behold. Think of all the beholds that God has given you through the Word of God. Think how many times He tells you to step out of your comfort zone and go do something. <laughs> and aren't you glad today that you did it and wasn't that a behold moment you can write about the behold when you get at the end of the story it should behold 
what God, what a marvelous plan God has for our life. What a marvelous plan. Remember the direct of God, will of God is one of cl three classifications, directive, permissive, overruling. I want to show you how it worked in King Ahab. I showed you how it worked in Elijah. Let me show you how it worked in King Ahab. Here's how it worked. Directive will of God. Get rid of demonic idolatry of, of, of Baal from the north kingdom. Here's how it went. It went, and the point was this. King Ahab, king of the priest nation of the north. To whom are you going to serve and worship, right? You know what he said? Baal. That's what he did with the directive will of God. He said, no thank you. That's the permissive will of God. Ahab had a choice and a decision, listen, to be part of a spiritual awakening in the north kingdom. And they needed it bad, didn't they, Kurt? He's the eighth king. And he, Ahab was worse than all the seven ahead of him, and they were all evil. <laughs> and he had a chance to be part of a spiritual awakening with a prophet called Elijah. And God gave him a choice and a decision, and he said no. And so we have the overruling will of God, the second cycle of divine discipline, and God shut down his economy to bring a what? Listen to me, to do what? To bring a spiritual awakening, right? They could have done it the easy way, right? We're going to do it the hard way, but the, the, it still stands. I want a spiritual awakening. You want to know why we're going through what we're going in America? It's a spiritual awakening. And listen, it'll never go to America or the world unless it starts in the church. It always starts in the church, Kurt. It always starts in the church. It don't stand... The, world, the world's got their way going. It starts in the church and spreads to the world. We have a chance to be in our, in our Western civilization, we have an opportunity to be part of a third spiritual awakening. I've talked about it for years. It's, it's on the front burner now. It's never been more clear in my soul when I spoke about it 25 years ago. I really believe this. I, I, I believe this is it. I believe we have a great chance to spread from America a spiritual awakening that will have its, it takes its own wave. You don't have to send people. Listen, it will take people with it. People that God has got prepared. The Luthers and all these people got them already ready for that wave to run with it. Elijah had, listen, golly, boom, people. God had 7,000 men ready, men and women ready to go with the wave, right? Elijah thought he was the only guy. God had, had seven waiting for the spiritual awakening to come to drive it in full force. Point number three. Uh, hey, J John, where am I on my time? Ten thirty. Well, let me let me do three. I'll never get four. Four is your, on yours. We got to come out of here at some kind of decent hour. Listen to three. God was also teaching Elijah another lesson on the same doctrinal principle of logistical grace. That, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? The word provide, ravens to provide, widow to provide, that's pretty obvious. And my God will supply all your needs according to the riches uh, in glory in Christ Jesus. That's our verse, isn't it, Horton? That's our verse. That's our verse. That's what we live by. Who do, you, who do you trust and obey to bring these things to pass? Huh? God Almighty, does he do it? Saving grace, logistical grace, you know, growing grace, suffering grace, dying grace, surpassing grace. Of course he does. 
God is the epitome of grace, and he wants to share grace, the abundance of God's grace with us. We push back on it. It's not him. He's pushing forward. We're pushing back. We don't want grace unless we can understand it and figure it out and see it ahead of time. You're always behind the curtain. You're always behind the curtain. He has taught him the lesson from the raven, logistical grace, and he's going to teach it from the widow of Zarephath, the logistical grace. He's going to teach him that I can change your circumstances. I can change your places. I can move you completely from one place to another place. Completely do it. Listen, and my grace is always enough. My grace is always enough. Right? 2 Corinthians 12, chapter, verse 9. Sufficient means enough in street language. That's enough. It's enough. It's always enough. It may not be enough for tomorrow, it'll be enough for today, and that's all he promises. That's manna from heaven, isn't it? One reason, uh, the principle, listen to the principle. Always pay attention to those doctrines that God keeps teaching you. I hear people complain about, but to me, I, I'm t you, you keep telling me this and that like I know your life. I promise you, I don't know your life. I don't know enough about you to tell, to, I don't know your address. I don't prepare messages that I think you need to hear as an individual. I do it collectively. I don't have any idea. Every week I have an open slate. I have no idea. I just do what the Lord, in my, in my heart, I just do what I think the Lord wants me to do. One reason for doctrinal rep, uh, uh, repetitiveness, repetition. Listen to me now. Is to get rid of old man, cosmos diabolicus, thinking that keeps conflicting with the word of God. That's, that's, a, a, that's Ahab's problem. It's not Elijah's. Oh, yeah. And here it is, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to the world. That's the part of your life that objects to what you hear by the word of God. That's Ahab's problem. He's conformed to the world. See, I don't have to prove you what I say. I don't have to prove it to you. The Lord will prove it to you. And my job's not to prove it to you. My job is to explain it to you. The Lord's job is to prove it to you. He will prove to you the will of God. Romans 12, 2. He will prove to you the will of God. That is good, acceptable, and perfect. Conformity to the world says, well, you're going to have to show me ahead of time. He's like, I never show you anything ahead of time. I don't have to show you nothing. I just have to tell you. I'll show you as we go. It's show and tell. You know, it's not tell and show. Well, anyhow, do not be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, good, acceptable, and perfect. For Ahab, it was three and a half years of suffering under the second cycle of divine discipline because he wouldn't obey the word of God. He's the, he's the king of the priest nation of Israel of the North Kingdom. And God is the supreme ruler of him. And he won't listen to the supreme ruler of his. Hello. But for Elijah, this three and a half years was spiritually training with the expectation of a national spiritual awakening. A spiritual awakening. Well... Be sure to read in point number four what Jesus talks about this widow. 
I'll come back to that next week. I'm going to show you the two women in Phoenicia that had an enormous influence upon the life of Elijah. Two women. Two Sidonians. Two Sidonian women. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace for these that are attending with us, Father, on this Sunday morning around the world. We thank you for that. I pray, Father, they would stay with us for a year. Uh, stay with us through, certainly through, through the life of Elijah. What they will learn will, will be astonishing to their life about the need for a great spiritual awakening that must come from the church of Jesus Christ everywhere in the world. And I pray for that. I pray we will see it with evidence and clarity out of the word of God in the life of Elijah, in Jesus' name, amen.